بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم دس از دی الیونتھ ایپیسوڈ آف دی سمری آف دا قرآن وی آر بگننگ دی تھرڈ گروپ آف سوراز فرام ٹو نائٹ آئی ہیو مینشنڈ ایٹ دا بگننگ آف دس پریزنٹیشن آف سمری دیٹ دا قرآن ہیز بین divided into seven sura groups such that each group begins with one or more Meccan suras and ends with one or more Madan suras. Each group has its own theme, each group has its own uh, arrangement of suras which uh, all support and effectively present, describe the theme in a certain logical sequence. This particular group of surahs is comprised of 15 surahs, 14 of which are Meccan. They were revealed before the migration to Medina in the first 13 years of uh, the prophetic mission. And there's only one surah, Surah Nur, which is a Madanin surah. In this <coughs> surah, What we find is that uh, the people of Mecca, the Quraysh, the leadership in particular is being warned against the dire consequences of uh, their wrong attitude. There is good news given to the believers of uh, ultimate victory and dominance of this message uh, against the enemies and also these surahs mention uh, instructions to the believers for them to be purified, cleansed and be <clears throat> required to go through spiritual and moral excellence, the process of it. The Quraysh are directly addressed in this uh, group. Jews and Christians are talked of indirectly They had started appearing in the background to support Quraysh so that they could somehow silence or eliminate this emerging threat that was, that was there to uh, their so-called religious supremacy. So they were also beginning to play a role. And uh, <clears throat> the Prophet, may God mercy be on him, and believers, are addressed to. Uh, probably it's, it would be the right time for me to remind again that when we read the Quran, uh, we would do well to find it out when we are reading a certain surah as to which part of the prophetic mission does it belong to. The Quranic surahs All of them belong to one of the six uh, phases of prophetic mission. Uh, it started from the phase of Inzar, warning, followed by Inzar-e-Aam, warning to everyone, general universal warning. That period <clears throat> was followed by the period of itmam e that is, the evidence of uh, uh, the undeniable um, truth was established and it was declared that the truth is now manifest, followed by uh, the declaration of disassociation from the disbelievers and the announcement of migration to Medina. These are the phases in the Meccan stage of the Quranic revelation. In the Madanan stage, there are two further stages in the Madanan phase. <clears throat> One is the phase of uh, cleansing, purification and moral and spiritual excellence for Muslims and they are being guided and directed to follow a certain path and the instructions for them to reach that goal. And finally, there are verses and surahs which are talking about the punishment to be 
meted out to the disbelievers. These surahs, the first two surahs, Yunus and Hud, uh, the uh, 10th and 11th surahs of the Quran, which form a pair, they belong to the third phase, that is the phase where an undeniable <coughs> evidence, evidence is established for the truthfulness of the message. So let's start with Surah Yunus first. It starts with Alif Lam Ra, which are the letters, uh, disjointed letters, which uh, also begin Surah Hud as well, which is one indication of the fact that the two surahs are forming a pair. The Almighty says, Akan Ali Nasi Ajaban. Has it come as a surprise for people? An Auhaina, the fact that we have revealed Ila Rajulim Minhum to a messenger, to a prophet from amongst them who has come to warn them, uh, warn people of dire consequences if they reject the message. And he has come to give good news to the believers that there is a position of great respect for them before their Lord. So is it surprising for these people of Mecca and those who are not believing it? Instead of accepting this reality, which was the logical response, realistic, rational response, they declare that it's a clear magic. It is affecting us. It's impressive. But it's impressive in the sense, in the category of magic. If it is influencing some people, it's just simply because of uh, the magical touch that it has in it. It's not genuine. That's what they were trying to say to their uh, people. The Almighty is saying uh, that these people are not accepting this message because uh, they're so deeply uh, involved in their worldly matters and they're obsessed with a love for uh, worldly gains that they're not interested in knowing the truth. So God Almighty says in the Lazina, La yarjuna liqana wa radhu bil hayat dunya. Those people who do not look forward to meet us and are content with this life alone and are fully satisfied with it, those who are heedless, those are the ones who are heedless to our signs. They are the ones whose abode shall be the hell because of their evil deeds. In other words, human beings have been given this uh, ability to know the truth, to acknowledge it, to support it. That's what comes natur naturally to all humans. That's what is the rational approach. However, there are obstacles, impediments. The biggest obstacles is this worldly life. It's glamorous, it's attractive. It attracts our attention towards itself and somehow makes it difficult for us to focus on the truth about this life the realities that are convincing and yet people are involved in their immediate distractions of life so deeply that they start rejecting and denying the truth. So that's what the Almighty is accusing this, these disbelievers of. The Quran tells us in verse 15, وَإِذَا تُطْلَى عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُنَا بَيِّنَاتِ when our clear signs, verses are recited to them, those who don't look forward to meeting us say, these disbelievers, the polytheists of Mecca, the leaders of Quraysh, they say, bring us a Quran other than this one or alter it. Say to them, O Prophet, tell them, it is not for me to change it of my own accord. I only follow that is what is revealed to me. If I were to dis disobey my Lord, I fear the punishment of a fearful day. That is, how can I change the Quran on my own? It's from God. 
But uh, the people of uh, Mecca, the Quraysh, the leaders in particular, they didn't want the Quran to be accepted because even though it was convincing, it was making a lot of sense, it was requiring them to change their religious ways. It was ultimately threatening them to change the kind of luxurious living they were having there was their leadership was getting threatened and they deep in inside they didn't want that to happen so they said if you want us to to get inclined towards this book it is impressive in some ways but change it we want a few amendments to be introduced to the book or bring a different book this one is not acceptable it's too inflexible it's too strict and is uh, criticizing our religion religious traditions our gods uh, too strongly so the almighty uh, asked the prophet to tell them that that's not possible it's not my book i have not come up with my own religious ideas it's from god and i too am bound to follow it the personality of the prophet was presented by the quran in this verse for people to know to see for themselves that this book and its this message is from god so in verse 16 the almighty says qul law sha allah ma talautuhu alaykum if god had willed i would not have recited this quran to you wala adrakum bihi nor would god have informed you about it it was god's decision it's his planning that's going on faqad labistu fikum umuran min qablihi and i have lived with you for a lifetime before it was revealed afala taqilun then do you not ponder do you not reflect did you ever see say, me saying anything similar to what i am saying now i have lived for 40 years with you i have shown you to be a man who was of the highest uh, moral uh, dispensation i uh, was declared by you as a sadiq the truthful alamin the trustworthy as mor- morally upright but i was never interested in the kind of uh, stuff that i am presenting to you now in the name of god had that been the case you probably would have had a right to to claim that what i'm saying is uh, is my own my own concoction i have invented all this myself but the fact that i have lived for you for such a long time uh and as a person who is very reliable but on the other hand i was never ever found interested in either literary activities or matters that had, had to do with theology never ever so how can you come up with the claim that this is my own doing then the quran a few verses later in verses 57 and 58 says ya yuhannas o people qad jaatkum mawizatum mir rabbikum there has come to you an exhortation from from your lord wa shifaa lima fi sudur and healing for what is in the hearts and a guidance and mercy for the believers wa khudam wa rahmatul lil mu'minin tell them it has come through the bounty and mercy of god let them re- rejoice on its arrival it is better than what they are accumulating that is this book has come to enable us to cleanse our inner weaknesses the inner ailments uh, that's what it means when it says it's shifaa lima fi sudur hearts carry ailments ailment of obsessive love for this worldly life ailment of uh, hatred ailment of jealousy ailment of hypocrisy etc so this book has come to purify me to enable me to get rid of these contaminations so whoever is able to understand it this message 
it's a guidance for him and it's going to be a mercy in the next life this guidance is going to lead the individual on the way to the right path and would eventually enable uh, the individual to be successful in the next life where god's mercy is going to overwhelm such people so rejoice celebrate the fact that the book has come to you the quran then goes on to <clears throat> describe the stories of uh, Noah, Nuh alayhi salam and Moses, Musa alayhi salam. This letter story of Musa alayhi salam, towards the end, when the Almighty tells us that Pharaoh and his followers were subjected to punishment, as has always been the case when a messenger of God comes. When Pharaoh was about to be drowned, the Almighty says, he addressed him directly and told him fal yawman unajjika bi badanika today i am going to save your body that is you're going to be killed but your your body is going to remain intact litakuna liman khalfaka aya so that you should become for people to come later a sign wa inna kathiran minan nasi an ayatina la ghafilun and there are many people who despite seeing our clear signs they still remain heedless they don't take seriously uh this verse was revealed 1400 plus years ago it has never ever been altered from the day it was revealed because it was memorized and the entire quran is fully preserved but it's only maybe a couple of years, uh, centuries ago or even less that the body of pharaoh was discovered mummified and it can be found the body of rameses 2 is preserved and currently on display in the museum and the royal mummies chamber in the grand egyptian museum cairo so the almighty promised that this fellow the enemy of god and his messenger his body is not going to be allowed to uh be destroyed the way most bodies disintegrate and disappear and this uh, promise has remarkably come true towards the end the almighty says in verses 99 and 100 wala sha rabbuka la amana man fil ardi kulluhum jamia had it been god's will your lord's will all those who are living on the face of this earth would have believed afa anta tukrihun nas hatta yakunu mu'minin but god has given them freedom and people choose to do good and believe and they choose to do wrong and disbelieve so are you going to force people until such time that they believe so prophet don't worry about it do your job and leave the rest to me i am putting people to test Verse hundred of this surah, surah number ten, is an important verse. It says, "Wama kana li nafsin an tu'mina." There is no possibility for any individual human to believe, "Illa bi iznilla," except by the will of God, by His leave. "Wa yajalul rizza al lazin la yaqilun," and He casts. filth to surround those people who don't use their intellect so in other words the almighty is saying that the decision to enable a person to have faith belief or not is god's decision and god takes his decision on the basis of whether a person is uh, cleansing himself morally or not if a person is morally filthy then that filth is cast upon him is made to surround him and it becomes a hurdle an obstacle for such a person to believe and this happens when the individual is not using his intellect properly if a person uses his intellect properly then he would know that uh, what is good has to be followed what is evil has to be ignored and that 
we always ought to make an earnest attempt to know the truth. But those who are not interested and not using their intellect properly, they are deprived of faith. So, oh prophet, you should not worry about it. It's God's decision. We move on to the next surah, which is the partner surah of Surah Yunus, which is Surah Hud. By the way, both surahs are named after two different prophets. Yunus and Hud alayhi musalam. Uh, it starts with this verse uh, Alif Lam Ra as indeed has been the case with Surah Yunus thereby declaring that the two are partners, they form a pair. The first verse says Kitabun Uhkimat Ayatuhu Summa Fussilat it's a book whose verses were revealed in a brief but comprehensive form. Uhkimat ayatuhu. Summa fussilat. Then they were explained in detail. Villadun hakim and khabir. From the one who is all wise, all informed. That is, the manner the Almighty has designed his book is such that he has mention his verses in a way that they are brief, comprehensive. That's what some verses are. That's what most of the verses that were revealed at the beginning time of the revelation were. And the same principles that are mentioned therein are then expanded, explained in detail. Uh, so, it's like there are seeds and there are crops, there are plants emerging from the very same seeds. The Quran is absolutely consistent. Sometimes it says what it wants to deliver in the form of basic principles and on other occasions the same principles are expanded to either be described in detail as details as principles or the mention of the practical expectations of those principles is to be found in the Quran. This the Almighty has done to make sure that uh, people understand what the Almighty wants to deliver to them, wants them to, to understand. Because when you have uh, the summary mentioned which obviously is, is good, is effective, but it is not enough because we would not like to know the details. And then the same summary, summary is followed by details and the two together are consistent. Then probably that's the best way of teaching people about a certain subject. And that's what the Quran does. So for example, you know, we have in the Quran the mention that the Almighty is Ar-Rahman Rahim in Surah Al-Fatiha, the first surah of the Quran, immediately followed by the mention that he is Maliki of Middin. So it's a basic principle mention in a very brief manner. The same brief mention is elaborated, explained a little bit more in verse uh, in, in Surah 6, Al-Anam, verse 12, where the Almighty says, Kataba ala nafsihi rahma he, God, has written it down, made it binding on himself that he's going to be merciful. The same thing, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. And then, instead of Malik Yawmuddin, he says, La yajma'annakum, he's most certainly going to gather you all, Ila Yawmil ila Qiyamah, on the day of judgment, La Bafi, about which there is no doubt. So, what was described in brief in Surah Al-Fatiha, was expanded a little bit more in uh, Surah Al-Anam and there are many other examples in the Quran of uh, similar nature. We move on to verse 17 wherein the Almighty says that, you know, this theme we've already found is repeated over and over again, that it's good humans, good-natured humans who have cared to preserve the goodness of their nature who believe. 
The Quran says, "Afaman kana ala bayinatim rabbihi wa yatluhu shahidum minhu wa min qablihi kitab Musa imam wa rahma ulaika yu'minuna bihi." Can a person who is following the clarity of his good nature from his Lord and then comes an evidence in the form of the Quran from his Lord too? While Moses' book is already there as a guide and mercy, can he disbelieve and reject the Quran? No, he cannot. Such people would certainly believe in it. So, if the message of God is being presented properly, and most certainly when the prophets come, they do it most effectively and convincingly. And there are people out there who are good natured, who have cared to preserve their good nature and are working in the right direction, then there is no chance that such good people would not believe. And uh, those who are evil would not be able to see the light of the day because their goodness of nature has already been lost. And God's words do not impress the hearts that have gotten hardened. But obviously, this, this principle cannot be applied in situations where God's message is not being presented properly. Well, in that case, those people who are the custodians of the message should worry about it. As to why is it that on the one hand, they have the truth with them. There are many people out there in the society who are good, good-natured, kind, helpful, truth-seeking, truthful. All the good virtues are there and yet they are not believing, probably there is something wrong the way the message is being delivered, something wrong with the way, the way we are behaving and with the way we are preaching, we are proclaiming the message. We then have the story, a heart-rending story of uh, Noah's son, Nuh son, uh, in verses 40, 45 to 47. Uh, the Quran tells us that uh, at the end of the, the mission, when the message was delivered to his nation, uh, the Almighty, as indeed has always been the case with the stories of messengers, decided that Noah's nation is going to be destroyed by floods, by the natural calamity of floods. So, he was asked to make a ship, to, to make a boat, ark, and uh, there were uh, those very few people, his family members, who uh, went to uh, on board the ship and they were saved, rescued while there was heavy downpour happening, water was coming out of uh, uh, the earth as well. And there was this son of uh, Nuh alayhi salam, one of them, one of uh, the four sons. Uh, he saw that waves swept him away. At that time, Noah, he called upon his Lord and he said, O oh Lord, my son is a part of my family and your promise is certainly true and you are the best of the judges. In other words, you promised me that my family is going to be saved. And yet my son, I can see right before my eyes that he is drowning. God responded, he is not a part of your family. His deeds aren't good. He is not a good person. He is not a part of your family. And don't ask me about what you don't know. Noah, the great uh, servant of God, responded by saying, I seek refuge in you, O God. If I ask for anything unreasonable, if you won't have mercy on me and won't uh, forgive me, I'll be among the losers. Thereafter, we move on to uh, the story in this surah of another great prophet, Abraham, Ibrahim alayhi salam. Verses 74 and 75. It tells us that when angels visited Abraham and his family, فَلَمَّا زَحَبَ عَنْ إِبْرَاهِيمَ الرَّوَعَ الرَّوْعُ وَجَاتْهُمْ وَجَاتْهُ الْبُشْرَى يُجَادِلُنَا فِي قَوْمِ لُوتِ And when the fright left Abraham, 
Abraham was frightened because he saw angels who apparently looked like humans and he treated them like humans and wanted to serve them with food. But he could see that they were not interested even though they, had, they, were, they didn't belong to the uh, locality where he was living and therefore they had, must have come from elsewhere and they should ordinarily be hungry. But they refused to have food. So that frightened Abraham and uh, the angels then com comforted him by telling him that they were angels and they had come to give a good news of a uh, son to him and his wife uh, despite their old age. So he felt comfortable. And then after this fright had gone, disappeared and he came to learn about the fact that these angels are now going to leave him and visit the uh, nation of Lot, Lut who was his nephew. And that nation is going to be destroyed because of them indulging in evil deeds as a consequence of which they were rejecting the messenger of God. The Quran says, Abraham began to argue with us concerning the people of Lot, the people of Lut. That is, he started saying to the Almighty, pleading, that these people should be spared. Why are you punishing them? And it's mentioned in brief in the Quran, but it's mentioned in greater detail in the Bible that Ibrahim salam said that, oh God, if even if uh, there are going to be 50 good people in that locality, are you still going to destroy them? He said, no, Ibrahim, I will not if there are 50 good people, but there aren't. Then he came down to 45, 40, 35, 30. And he kept on arguing with God until such time that he mentioned 10 or below. And God said that there aren't even 10 people who are good people, good humans, believing. And therefore, the Almighty said to him that Abraham, just leave it now you know, we are doing what we know is right. And instead of blaming Ibrahim salam, Abraham for arguing with God about what he had already decided, the Almighty says, Inna Ibrahim ala halimun avvahum muni. Abraham was forbearing, compassionate, ever inclining towards God reverting towards him. So he praised him lavishly. Imagine, Abraham is disagreeing with God, so to say, asking him not to punish uh, the nation of Lot. And uh, the Almighty is listening to him patiently. And at the end of this whole, uh, call it a debate, when Abraham is finally convinced that uh, these people don't deserve uh, to be spared. The Almighty praises Abraham. In other words, thinking with an open mind, critically thinking, is not what is condemnable. It's not that the Almighty declares independent thinking as undesirable. That's very much what God wants us to do. Because after all, this intellect that we all have is given by God, but he would want us to use our intellect properly, positively, uh, for good purposes. When somebody goes wrong and his uh, mind gets twisted and he starts using his intellect for evil purposes, is stubborn, inflexible, it's only then that the Almighty is uh, displeased and uh, does not approve of what the person is doing. We move on to verses 106 to 108, wherein the Almighty is mentioning a very important uh, policy regarding the punishment of hell. One of the problems with which some people have in understanding the message of the Quran is that even though it's understandable that people should be punished for what they have done, 
for their wrongdoings. However, there is this problem that always is uh, creating difficulty, agitating one's mind. To imagine that the punishment of hell to some individuals is going to be forever, never ever to end, that makes, you know, people uh, a bit too uh, disappointed and uh, it's, it's something which don't, they can't believe. It's, it's, it's a bit too much for a compassionate God to take that decision. After all, I mean, how wrong could a person go? How evil could a person be? Uh, no matter what, the punishment of hell for eternity is something which is difficult to, to absorb. So here comes the Quran always clarifying things for our advantage, to our advantage. It says, as for those who were destined to be miserable, they will be in the fire. For them therein will be crying and screaming. They will abide therein forever. Khalidina fiha ma da matis samawatu wal For as long as the heavens and the earth endure. That is, this is God's decision and God would do as he would choose to. This eternity is not necessarily the kind of eternity that you have in your mind. That it would, it would never ever end. The concept of eternity seems to be that there is a certain maximum time period in the planning of the Almighty for the hell to remain. Uh, and there are some people, unfortunate people, who would live in that place of misery for as long as it would last. Others would be removed from there. But it seems from this mention that the Almighty is saying that uh, it's a very likely possibility that God is going to make sure that the hell disappears after a while. Or oh, that while could be very long. Obviously, there is no reason why one should feel uh, comfortable about it. But the fact of the matter is, it's not the kind of eternity that we have in mind. Obviously, the next question arises, then if that's the case, then how about the eternity of the paradise? And the Quran again responds and says, as far as the paradise is concerned, it's the same description as was done about the hell, that people are going to live there forever, for as long as the heavens and the earth last but there is this following expression that says atan ghaira majzuz it's an endowment that would never be interrupted in other words here is a promise which will never end so that's an important understanding that we find in the quran at the end of this surah the almighty is mentioning one uh, clarification which uh, he does over and over and again in the quran he says, Walau shah Arab buka, had it been your Lord's will, Lajal and Nasa Ummatam Wahida, he could have made them one religious community. All humans would have belonged to one religion. But he didn't do so. Instead, he gave them freedom, which they exercise. So this life is a trial. Understand this reality. When people are to be tested and tried, they've got to have freedom which they would exercise on their own. They will use whatever freedom they have on their own volition. And as a result, obviously people would disagree with each other and will have different perspectives, views. So, this uh, freedom that has been given to humans, uh, they exercise and they are different. So, wala yazaluna mukhtalifin, they will continue to disagree with each other and therefore, do not be too concerned and disturbed about it. This is God's design and through his design, God is ensuring that he distinguishes good people from bad people and at the end of the day, after this 
worldly life is over, he will reward those who turned out to be good and would punish those who turned out to be evil. May the Almighty enable us to understand God's message properly and may He enable us to follow the right path properly and consistently.